Ladies and gamers, welcome to Bill Noir TV. My name is Bill Noir, and you are watching Cast My Game Community Casts, where I cast your replays. For anybody new here, what is this all about, you ask? Well, uh, you have a replay, a 1v1 replay, that is anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes long, approximately and it is at least master versus master level play and you'd like me to cast it just send it to my email belnoir at cesnam.cz you can find uh, the spelling of the email in the stream description below on twitch uh, title the email cast my game and please include a short description so i don't have to see the replay just tell me roughly what happened uh, if you have any shout outs you would like to add so that I can give a proper shout out to you uh, a website, team, uh, your stream, Twitter, anything uh, add those as well and I'll make sure to do that so what do we have on the menu today? today we have uh, three games it's going to be a ZBZ, a TVZ and a TVP and, uh, just to prepare for this, I gotta find. I gotta find. Uh, <laughs> I gotta find those shout outs for one of the players here. Um. There we go. Here it is. Okay. Coming back to you guys in the chat, let me just uh, refresh the viewer list so that I can greet everybody as is proper. So, greetings to Estman, Gropa TV, uh, NPGL, Aussie89CZ, and Zas. Anybody who played Brood War uh, probably knows. Uh, who Zas was. It was one of the Cerebrates of the Zerg Swarm. Um, not very... not a very likable character, but I think Dagoth was even worse. That was an... that was an arrogant son of a bitch. Organism, excuse me, son of an organism, because, you know, Zerg, they don't actually have... Uh, they don't reproduce Okay, you know what? Let's just drop it. Let's just drop it. Not gonna go into biological details of Zerg reprodu reproduction. No. <laughs> Not going there. Alright, so let's start off uh, with a ZVZ. Um, it's going to be derelict watcher, as far as I can, as far as I can tell. Uh, let us see. Yes, the scene is switched. All right, spawning in the bottom left, we do have the red Zerg player from Team My In. As I pause the game, My Insanity. It's Penguin. Recently came back from Dreamhack. As everybody knows, their player Stardust won the whole thing, defeating Jadong in a nail-biting series 3-2. And his opponent is going to be none other than Snufe. I know that you see a barcode, but this is actually Snufe. So, let us see here. Uh, so far, no shenanigans going on. Uh, no early pulls. Nothing of the sort probably going to be yes, and extract a trick right here by Penguin. Bo both players getting overlords, so doesn't look like it's gonna be a it's gonna be a temple. It can s it could have been still an overpool if uh, one of these players would just not build drones after that uh, uh, after that overlord popped out of the larva, but. Uh, 
yeah, so so far they're playing standard. Now let's see which one of these guys is going to be going for a pool first and which one is going to be going for a hatchery first. I wouldn't be surprised by neither. Uh, and it looks like both of these guys are just building their pools. And uh, Penguin immediately going, after uh, going into gas, whereas uh, Snoofa looks like he wants to be getting a hatch down pretty, pretty soon. So Penguin, he's going to have a gas advantage over his opponent. And since his hatch is going to be later, the way this will this will play out, either Penguin will play defensively and try to go try to tech up, try to get a uh, reasonably fast lair, or what Penguin might opt to do uh, upon scouting that uh, his opponent's uh, expansion is way way sooner than his own, he might try to go for something aggressive with Banings. Already 50 gas has been mined. Uh, let's see. There is actually no reason to go baning this this early, so I really suspect he'll be getting a uh, he'll be getting speed first, and uh, the gas only just now finishing for Snoofy. Penguin uh, sending his overlord towards the natural base. Uh, by the timing of the natural, he's going to know what is up. You can see that the difference is minuscule, about 30 seconds, but it is still uh, it is still quite enough. Of course, he probably won't be able to scout the gas, because the queen will be popping out momentarily here. Speed starting for Penguin, and he's pulled, o pulled drones off gas, so he's not going to be aggressive. He can still go for something like a uh, uh, speedling bust, but I rather doubt this is going to be the case. Uh, but he is going to have earlier speed, so what Snoofy should do here right now, he should get a Baning Nest uh, reasonably quickly after he starts his speed, uh, just to stay alive uh, and stay safe versus any kind of speedling aggression. Very smart thing here uh, we can notice by Penguin. He built six lings, which is a reasonable number in a ZVZ matchup that you build early on, but he's hiding them. He doesn't want an Overlord which might come in, he doesn't want an overlord to see them. So that's uh, that's really nice. And now he's moving the links over. And uh, wow, it looks like he does want to be aggressive. Look at this, speed is almost finishing and he's producing 16, 18 links. So he's just using this hatchery as a production facility, he's not using it as a, as a uh, mineral mining base. Baning Nest is a little bit too late uh, is down a little bit too late for Snoofy, so uh, Penguin might be able to do quite a lot here, and uh, Snoofy, seeing the move out with the Overlords right here, uh, he immediately pulls drones into the main base. He's going to try to block the ramp with the Queens. The queens are going to fall, though, and the ba even the Baning Nest is being cancelled because it, it was built in the natural base, so it uh, would have been, uh, would have been uh, killed and this is a really, really, really bad spot for Snoofy uh, to be in. Both players have speed now, so it is all co it is going to come down. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> it's going it is it is gonna basically the micro and the numbers are going to be the deciding factor. That's what I'm uh, that's what I'm trying to say. And it looks like for a little bit there, Penguin does have the advantage, but the numbers of links are starting to climb a little bit for Snoofy. Only three odd links remaining on Penguin's side, and Snoofy will defend. The hatch will stay alive. Doesn't look like... Oh, but more aggression is incoming by Snoofy. He, he squeezed in two rounds, two production rounds, or two larva rounds, whatever you want to call it, of drones, bringing himself um, on par with his opponent, but after that he's going immediately into more speedlings and lair. He's going to be using those speedlings to, um, well, not die to a counterattack, that's one thing, but another thing, he's going to use those speedlings, once he defends, he's going to use them to pressure his opponent, and that will allow him uh, space and time to gather more gas, as we can see he's putting down here, and get his lair tech down. Probably going to be going with a spire. Because I know Penguin loves his mutalists. Oh, nice detonation there, but having two defensive banings is going to deter uh, these uh, additional links from Snoofy from attacking. Snoofy only... Go to hell, Komodo, antivirus. Snoofy only just now getting his lair, so Penguin 
way ahead in that regard. If we look at the gas count, he almost has twice the gas his opponent's got because he did not invest as much gas into Banings as his opponent did. And as I predicted, Spire is going down. Now Snufe should know what's up. He's only seeing speedlings, nothing else. Two defensive banings up on his ramp. Penguin will have to be careful. He doesn't have vision up there. So probably sending only one ling. There we go. The one ling sees a spine crawler and two banings. So Penguin pretty much knows that that is not attackable. Uh, you generally don't want to attack into a position such as this. But his spire is has about 50 or 40 seconds to go still. So until it finishes, Penguin has to stay alive. His opponent going for a spire as well. He's going to have a little bit uh, fewer gas. As I say that, I kind of notice that he's going to have about two to three less mutilisks. Um, that is, if both players uh, uh, invest all of their gas into mutilisks. Uh, Peng what, what Penguin might actually try to do is go for a carapace upgrade and mutilisks at the same time. And it is going to come down to never stopping mutilisk production and having good engagements and good micro. Speaking of engagements, yeah, but look at Penguin, look at his macro. He's got twice the number of links or over that number that his opponent has. So, you know, that that difference is, of course, the difference between this, uh, or, or in some part between this hatch and not having a hatch. Penguin only now going to get his. First couple of mutas is in production. Spire for his opponent finishing only just now. Penguin is... Uh, thinking of getting aggressive again. He knows that he's got a huge Ling lead. That is going to change because uh, because uh, more Lings are being produced by Snufe and Penguin. Well, he's going to deny this third base from coming up. It should get cancelled. Or maybe not. Nine Mutalisks in production for uh, for Snufe, so maybe he's hoping he can get there in time. Both players are going for the Carapace and the Mutalisks at the same time. And Penguin is trying to get his third base. I think this base will fall though. So if Penguin can defend this third base and prevent it from going down to the counter attack, he's going to put himself in a very comfortable position. He's down on drones, that much is true. But the, the amount of bases is uh, roughly even. Let's look at the Mutalist count. It is quite comparable. So it is going to come down to engagement, micro, and using those links on the grounds to soak up some of those goo some of those uh, bounces from uh, the Mutalisks. Let us see. Also, having a couple of banings here will prevent any uh, Ling Rumbais to threaten that base. There we go, as it finishes up. And the curve base for the Mutalisks is not done yet, and I think both players will be kind of wary of engaging their opponent without that upgrade. They really want to wait until the curve base upgrade finishes before they think about engaging in any way, shape, or form. And the upgrade is done for Penguin, so he might try to have a go for it. The Mutalisk counts are still very, very, very close, as are the Zergling counts. As is everything, basically. Everything is so close for these two players. And right now, thanks to the lack of map awareness uh, by Snufe, the Mutalists are trying to swing into the main base. Picking any number of extractors off is very, very good for Penguin right now, because that limits the gas income for his opponent, meaning less Mutalists. This will take some time to, to rebuild. It takes uh, about half a minute to rebuild, and then only you can start mining again. And Penguin, he's been really active with his Mutalisks. So look at this, picking off everything. He's got total map control, whereas his opponent, well, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to uh, establish a map control of his own just by killing the overlords of his opponent. But he's still, he's still getting caught off guard all the damn time. He doesn't know, most of the time, he doesn't know where the Mutas of Penguin are. 25 to 22. Oh, this is not a fight Penguin would like to take. He has to back off of this or should back off from this. Ah, he's losing the air battle. Finally backing off, but now the plus one attack for his Mutalisks will finish and that will give him a decisive advantage in any upcoming air-to-air -air battles that will happen on this map. 
neither player f going for uh, Zergling upgrades actually. Getting care base upgrades for Zerglings is quite good if you are uh, positioning them underneath the air battle. That's a not good an engagement uh, for uh, for Snufe there, but Penguin is it. It seems like he's outnumbered here, totally outnumbered in the air. What will he do to get back into this game? He's got he's down three mutalisks, but the difference will uh, excuse me up three mutalisks. But uh, those engagements were not the uh, most ideal engagements you would like to have as a Zerg player. Fourth base going down for Penguin, as for his opponent as well. Still no ground upgrades, just uh, spores being built everywhere. I wonder, will one of these guys actually try an infester transition or something of the sort? That would be that would be pretty interesting to see. But so far, it looks like both of these guys are just uh, hell bent on uh, producing mutalisks and mutalisks and mutalisks. Nice penguin getting first two couple of volleys versus the mutalisks of his opponent. They are clumping up. This is not good news for Snufe. He will lose this battle quite convincingly, I have to say. Uh, the upgrades are even for both of these guys, but so many mutalisks being lost there for Snufe. A little bit of a scouting party here uh, from him as well, but uh, uh, Penguin catches on to that rather quickly and is just droning like a madman. He really wants to saturate that fourth base as soon as possible. Uh, Flyer Carapace level 2 on the way as well. Huge ram by of Lings by Snufe. This third will be defended though, and uh, only a couple of drones uh, gone down. 12 drones and another run by in the main base. The Spire, the Spire, will it go down? No, it will stay alive with 80 hit points remaining. Oh my goodness, that was so close. Penguin has to be really careful right now. Both his hatchery and his Spire are very, very, very close to dying. One Mutalisk swoop here and the Spire is dead, and that could mean game. As I said, if Penguin had two or four bandings here around the base, that Rumbai would have done absolutely zero damage. Zero damage. I think what Penguin is waiting for is the level 2 carapace upgrade and then he will try to kill his opponent. A uh, little bit of an action here over at the 4th as well. And uh, well, Snufa he's trying to send Lynx whichever way possible. Again, he tried to go for that Spire, but not being really successful. And it looks like Penguin will just let this base fall? No, I don't think so. I think he I think he wants to save it. There we go. Oh, but this Ling run by... This Ling run by Snufei, you have to react. You have to react. Come on, Snufei. Where are your links? Do you have any links out on the field? Yes, you do. 41 links. Where are they? They need to come in here and defend us. This base might fall, and that will bring Penguin even more ahead. Uh, as he already was. He's losing quite a lot of links, as is evident on the supply, but he can repopulate with more Miras, whereas his opponent can. At the same time, he's attacking the third base uh, here for uh, Snufe, and it is going to go down as well. Beautiful job by Penguin, pulling his opponent every which way, and, uh, well, Snufe not being able to react properly and defend all the fronts at once, and as a result, he's not now going for a huge, huge counter-attack, but look at this, He's his bank is dry, he's running out of resources. Has this been transfused? Yeah, it's being transfused right now. Penguin finally realizing that that's a very crucial point in, uh, in this game at this point in time. And uh, looks like Snufe is trying to do the same thing to Penguin, which Penguin did to him just now, but not working out, taking only one uh, base with him. But this base, oh, actually taking this base as well. Okay, so it's blow for blow. But uh, the upgrades are starting to roll in Penguin's favor. Any kind of air battle that will happen right now will heavily favor Penguin. And he's got the Mutal lead, so I think he should go for it at this point. Just give those hatcheries time to rebuild and just go for it. Maybe snipe these hatcheries again. That's exactly what he's doing. One has been cancelled and the drone has been killed. Will he go for the second one? as well. Let us see. Actually, clumping your mutas up like this is not good in a muta versus muta battle. I don't know why every single player does it. Just to spam APM, it's not good. Trust me. <laughs> You're gonna be losing health far faster than your opponent will be. And 
looks like... Oh, he's intercepting the Mutas. Penguin, turn around. Come on, you can fight this. You can fight this. And it looks like the Mutas of uh, Snoofy are going to be falling. Penguin retreating as, as soon as he saw those links. That's a very smart move because those would be absorbing uh, the uh, Vermglaive bounces of those Mutas. So, very wisely just moving out of the way. These hatches are finished right now, which means... Uh, they will give him larva, they will give him income, he just needs to hold on to those. He needs to use his mutalisks wisely and get here before this hatch falls for the third time. Well, looks like he won't. Can he get these mutas though? He's chasing. He's chasing them down. Plus two air weapons just now finished. And I think this is going to be it. There's just an overwhelming number of Mutalisks here for Penguin. He's got the upgrade advantage as well. And, uh, well, there's the GG from Snoofe. A little a little bit of a shaky game. But this is this is what uh, ZVP comes down to sometimes. Excuse the bad quality of casting, by the way. I'm really tired. And the weather is just crazy here. 35 degrees. And I don't have... I don't have air conditioning here. So, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit... It's a little bit bad. What am I going to tell you? Guys, uh, we'll have a tournament coming up. We should be making the announcement and opening signups on Monday. So, uh, if you want to take part, it's called the Followers Tournament for a reason. So, if you want to take part in the tournament, all you have to do is uh, follow the stream or follow my Twitter, because those are the uh, those are the accounts we can actually verify and check. Yes, I do have an application that can check for uh, Twitch followers real-time. Uh, it's for $108. For more info, description below the window here on Twitch. And there is also, in the useful links section, there is a link to the Liquipedia pages for the tournaments, so we can actually see uh, who won the previous ones? It's thirty-two dollars for the first, sixteen for the second, eight for the third, and four dollars per capita for the rest. Thirteen players. It's for sixteen players only. It's best of three every round, except the finals, which are best of five, and it is single elimination. All right, continuing on. Second game. I'm going to be a TVZ. By the way, guys, I am going to be streaming later after I finish the cast, just because it's a 20th episode I'm doing, so I'm feeling like uh, I should probably celebrate. And here we are on Belshir Vestige, spawning in the top left. We have the Red Terran Gwimblade from Team Angry Bunnies. Yes, I know it's funny. And in the bottom, it is going to go ahead and be the Blue Zerg, Faulting. So Faulting, just sending his Overlord out. And Matt looks like he's going to be walling off. Not a big surprise there. Now, you can basically, from the, from the start of the game, as a Terran player, you can basically open up in two ways. You can open up with a gas, or you can open up without a gas. If you're opening without a gas, that's, uh, that's ballsy as shit, let me tell you. But, uh, lately, we have not seen that many gasless openings by Terrans. That's Wings of Liberty. That's in the past. Some of these guys are still doing it, especially if they're going for command centers first, which is not what Matt is doing. And uh, he's dropping down a very, very early gas, so probably going to be opening up with a Reaper or two. 
I would highly doubt it if he would try to go for more than two Reapers. It's not really that efficient and it delays your other tech and uh, upgrades, stim combat shields and that sort of jazz. Looks like Folting is going to go ahead and go for a hatch first. And he does have a pretty good uh, timing here. I mean, scouting timing. He did send out a drone because since he's going for a hatch first, he wants to know what his opponent is opening up with. Even gets an SCV hero drone to which Gwynblaze says, Shit. I should not have lost that. Oh. Gwynblade being annoying a little bit. So, did the Zerg see the gas? Yes, he did. So he knows what is going to be coming up. He's getting a getting a, a pool and a gas straight after it. Now, um, his wings won't be out by the time that Reaper arrives there. I just want you to to note that it's not going to be those wings are not going to be out by that time. And speed is even further away than the links are. So this Reaper could do quite a lot. There will be no queens. This pool still has 15 seconds to go. And uh, which is roughly roughly the travel time of the Reaper across the map. So the Reaper is going to have approximately 20 seconds maybe to do some damage to s try to snipe some drones and it's going to it's going to come down to a micro ability of faulting. Uh, he can save drones by uh, trying to build uh, spine crawlers or just micro them around. And immediately he is pulling them. The links are getting very close to completion. This Reaper would would be very smart if he stayed off creep. He's going to try to snipe those Zerglings off. And we don't have a second one on the way. So this is this is pretty much a scouting Reaper. It's not meant to do damage. Gwynblade is trying to do what he can with the Reaper anyways. But this is not meant to do damage. It's meant to scout. Speed is going down for the Zerglings and Matsor, he's, uh, I mean, uh, Gwynblade, he's uh, getting uh, his uh, second command center, a reactor on the barracks and a factory, so pretty standard timing here. <coughs> second Reaper coming in, so I missed that one. Uh, but he won't be producing anymore for sure now. Two Reapers, three shot drones and lings alike. He's going to try to get some kills. Uh, the more links he can kill, of course, the better for him. <coughs> because if there are no links around, the Hellion follow-up will be especially deadly for uh, the Zerg player. Interesting uh, to note, uh, Zerg player is getting penalized carapace, so he wants to he wants to scout pretty e efficiently. He's a, he's got only one Overlord here. Only one Overlord, but with that penalized carapace, these Overlords will be able to move significantly faster out on the map. So it's uh, it's much more easier for the Zerg to uh, scout his opponent. Only two drones on gas. I don't know I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if that's a mistake. I have to assume it's a mistake because I don't know of any builds that would only require two drones in the gas. There we go, the third drone being added on. Two evolution chambers being built and a third command center. So Gwimblade is going for a very greedy uh, build or reasonably greedy build here. He's going to be relying on the Hellions for map control and uh, do some damage, but that's only until uh, either Roaches or Speed for the Lynx kicks in. The Speed already is out, so this is why Folting is moving out, and we can see that Gwynblade's build is lining up with the Speed timing quite nicely. The Hellions just popped out, so uh, he knows what he's doing. Just want to say. And we can see the Overlord speed finishing, so Folting is going to be getting his Overlords into, in position for scouting. He knows that it's a factory follow-up, so probably assumes attack lab on the barracks as well. Roach Warren is going down because uh, the links have been killed off, there are four Hellions out on the map, two more will be joining them, and Roaches will be badly needed to defend the mineral lines of Folting. Now let's see if he will be taking a uh, third base. Uh, or teching up. I would be for the favor of teching up. Already has uh, double upgrades on the way and he's getting range upgrades so probably going to go for a uh, roach based or maybe even roach based mid game or maybe even roach hydra late game which I would be strongly against because roach hydra is not that effective. Very few zergs can make it uh, can make it effective. Gwynblade checking for the third base and uh, upon seeing that there is none he's just going to do a little bit of harassment uh, building himself some mines and preparing for a uh, infantry transition, getting one one upgrades for himself. A little bit behind by uh, a little bit behind uh, by the Zerg player, 
But roasting very many drones here. Look, there's already five drones killed, nine drones killed. Those roaches are out, but there's not that many of them. Not enough. They're cornering the Hellions, though. So those Hellions, in time, will go, will go down. Boom, boom, and you're dead. But 11 workers killed. That's a uh, that's a pretty good tally for the Zerg player, uh, for the Terran player. And we can see multiple barracks going down. And uh, Stim on the way will be followed by uh, combat shields, and that should line up nicely with the first two or four medevacs as well. And when that Stim finishes, that will allow Gwynblades to float this command center over, because then he will be able to defend. Now let's see if we have a lair going down. Oop! As I say, the lair is just started for the Zerg player. It's about time, dude. That's that's a that's a. I don't I don't want to like bash on players, but. That is a um, kind of a late layer. Third base going down as well for the Zerg player, so... I have to say, Folting very smartly did not go for the third uh, until there was creep connecting the bases there. And uh, this queen will be used later on for injects probably. Or at least for a little while. Not mining from this gas, I don't know what is up with that. And as soon as it... Oh! Oh, so only a Roach mid-game, and now we're moving back into melee upgrades. This seems to be the current uh, standard go-to build for most of the Zergs, just using the Roaches to defend the Hellions, and optionally Hellbat drops, and then uh, transitioning out of it into more Carapace upgrades and melee upgrades for uh, the Zerglings, because they do want to get those Ultras out in the late game. That's one style to play. Another style to play would be the good old Langbling Mutalisks, but they're not as you know, it's 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 a different style. It's uh, uh, it plays out a little bit differently, but it's got a couple of advantages. Uh, first and foremost, you are kind of safe versus drops. As uh, long as you have those mutas out on the field, uh, you can pick off uh, medevacs and continue to pick them off, limiting their number, and uh, you have map awareness as well. So you see any uh, medevacs flying around, you just go snipe them, and that means you are losing. Uh, you are losing fewer drones. Now with the Ultras, uh, the composition is not that mobile. The Speedlings are, but uh, the Ultras are not that fast, which means you can get out-dropped, you can get out-maneuvered by the highly mobile uh, bioforce of the Terran player. So let's see. The Zerg player is going to try to take a fourth base and uh, gradually transition into Mass uh, Ling Bling Muta style, maybe even adding Infestors in the late game. Well, sh we shall have to see if that will be his choice. It's not necessary, but I would say I would say versus a good player, you you should have at least a couple of Infestors, like four or six, because um, they versus good players they are essential in uh, letting the Ultralisks and the Banelings do their damage. Third base down for the Terran player, and uh, yep, infestation pit going down. That is going to be for the hive, and uh, of course the Zerg player wants to continue upgrading. So he's getting a level two melee upgrades right now, and level two carapace. He wants to get to that three three as soon as possible. And he, uh, the thing is that uh, you know th there is a timing for Gwynblade here, which he can use. It's a two two timing with his infantry, and we can see the. 2-2 upgrades are getting close to being down, so Gwynblade is moving out. He wants to get rid of as much of this creep as possible. He can even start dropping the uh, Zerg player in the process as he's clearing out this creep. He just has to be very, very careful not to be caught off guard out in the open. Remember, on creep, Zerg sees you. Look at the vision. Faulting knows everything. He knows where the units are. He can try to go for a surround. The mines are not burrowed, and there's, there's only five of them, so... Those five detonations go off, and you have nothing. There we go. Mines are burrowing, but... Uh... Oh, what the hell? What did I just see there? Okay, let me pause and let me rewind, because this was just freaking too good. I almost thought that the army is out of range of the, wi of the Widow Mines already. Certainly these two, but no. I have to see that explosion again. Let me slow that down for you. Okay, so here we go. There go the links. Look at the reaction time on Gwynblade. Stimming immediately and burrowing the mines. And some of them burrowing here. BAM! All the links are gone. Unbelievable. 
and this gives a decisive advantage to the turn player. 170 food versus 100 of faulting. He, right now he's got no way of holding on to that fourth base. An interesting transition choice here into Swarm Host. I don't think this is going to work. It works decently well or very well versus Mech. And versus uh, kind of like that static sieging up Terran, but not versus Bio Mine. Gwynblade getting multiple additional command centers down. He's looking to macro it up in such a big style. And look at this, Fulting al almost has a zero army. And the fact that he's going Swarm Hosts and not Ultralis. Actually, there are no Swarm Hosts in production yet because he can't... Af he can't... Wait, what is he doing? Doesn't have enough larva, most probably. And Gwynblade all the while, look at the reinforcements, look at the production here. Everything is queuing up units. And, uh, well, Fulting, you better start praying, because only God can save you now, and I don't mean a flash. The Banelings are not even finished yet. More explosion going off onto that infantry. And he needs very good detonations right now. He needs very, very good detonations right now. At the same time, a drop in the main, distracting the Zerg player and allowing Gwynblade to get into a very good position here between the third and the natural. Has to cut by back now from those Banelings. And this will be cleaned up eventually, but at what cost? Infestation pit has gone down. One Evo Chamber has gone down as well. And more reinforcements being uh, produced by Gwynblade. Um, well, he, he doesn't have quite the number of barracks he would like to have had at this point because he could have been repopulating way faster, so he's dropping those down now anywhere that he's got space because he's kind of running out of room. He's like this, he's like this wife, you know, that always wants to buy new furniture. Always wants to be buying new furniture for the house and you're like, darling. We have a fully functional furniture everywhere. Why do you want to buy new pieces of furniture every six months? Because I'm getting, getting tired of the old things. I need some new look in my flat. Are you satisfied with how our flat looks like? So, you know, and then you end up with a situation when you have uh, too many pieces of furniture inside your flat and you just don't have room to put any more furniture anywhere. <laughs> oh my god, the reactions in the chat are just priceless. <laughs> right, so Gwynblade pushing in yet again, more reinforcements coming in, he's switching into a m more uh, Marauder Heavy style, and this is going to help him absorb uh, the uh, Baneling hits and the Roach Fire. Marines are being pretty close to effective, and 3-3 is just about to finish, even Ravens are in production to detect versus those Swarmos, and well, Gwynblade, he's doing a pretty good job, but ooh, splitting a little bit too late, and his infantry gets taken out. But still a couple of uh, units remaining, a uh, new wave of Locusts is being spawned. Look at this, nothing shoots up, which means those medevacs are going to be staying alive for a tremendous amount of time. And, uh, well, to be honest, Folting, well, he does have a pretty large bank, but he's not macroing the best, and he will start running out of that bank once he starts getting actual army units. He's not doing that. Look at this. 12 larva, not producing anything. Why? Gwynblade, on the other hand, is producing everything. Wouldn't be surprised if he took an another base right here. And uh, he's moving out on the map yet again, using just a small group of marines to clear out uh, creep. And faulting while he doesn't have any actual army. 27 lings, 4 roaches, and that's it. Apart from that, he's got 6 swarm hosts. That's not gonna cut it. They don't even have the proper upgrades, because... Uh, Initially, Faulting moved from range upgrades to melee upgrades. He wanted to transition into Ling, Baneling, Ultra, but instead, I don't know for whatever reason, instead of going Ultras, he switched it up and went Swarm Hosts. So those Swarm Hosts don't have the upgrades that are needed. Plus two Kerbis is finished already, so that's good. Seeker Missiles going on to a group of Roaches. Nice explosion there, but the infantry is being pushed back as well. Still a lot of units for faulting, so he may actually hold on, but I don't know for how long. I mean, 
Gwynblade, he's got all the cards, all the aces he can have. He's got the Raven for protecting those uh, Swarm Hosts so that he can kill them. Uh, and his units are being terribly affected with the 3-3 three, three upgrades on the infantry. Is he going to drop the main right now? That's a good boy. Very nice decision by Gwynblade. The drop will not be alive for long though because it's all on creep or over creep so those units will be able to uh, move around very very quickly. Pathogen glands and infestors are coming onto the field finally and uh, that's uh, that will improve Faulting's situation by miles because he will be able to lock down that infantry if, if he hits a fungal and uh, let those links do the damage instead of just letting the links die um, and the hive is being constructed as well. So maybe finally we will see that Ultralisk tank coming down. Meanwhile, look at the number of command centers that Gwynblade is building everywhere. Gonna be floating this one over here, of course. And uh, vaulting, well, he's uh, closing the gap in supplies. Building, uh, he's going for a very weird composition in my in my opinion. Swarm host infester link banely. I mean, sure, Swarmos are basically free units, but uh, I, d I just don't know how I feel how, how I feel about this. I mean, if Gwynblade starts producing mines again, it's going to become this uh, this tug of war if he does so. Another drop at the fourth base, killing a couple of uh, couple more drones. Twenty drones have been killed in total this game, but still 61 remaining for the Zerg player. And well, Gwynblade, he doesn't want to uh, let the Zerg player get a foothold in the center of the map. He's scanning constantly. I mean, at this point, he's got infinite scans. Doesn't have to worry about uh, worry about mules anymore. Um, little drop in the main base needs to be stimmed. If he takes down the pool, that will be very good for him. And well, the mine actually gets taken out before doing anything. So that was that was good. Another drop uh, at the third base, but that's being taken out. The main base drop, finally sitting in, taking out the pool. Might even take out the hive. No, we'll have to get out of there before that happens. Meanwhile, another engagement in the center of the map, and and you know, without the support of the main army, these uh, swarmers are not as good. Gwynblade very smartly is going to take the high ground, not the low ground. <laughs> those locusts are probably never going to catch up to that army, and Gwynblade, well, he really wants to kill those investors. That's what he wants to do. The swarmers are unburrowed. He has a chance right now, but he's being fungled, and the links are coming in. Very fortunate for him that he only stimmed and moved a small portion of his army and not his entire army, otherwise uh, it all would have gone down. The pool is being rebuilt here as well. Does Gwynblade know about this? Yeah, he does, so he can go for another snipe if he so chooses. The upgrades are still in his favor though, so... Oh wow. Another battle. The Roaches have too many hit points here for the Marines to take to take care of. The Infestors are here as well, together with the Locusts and the Swarm Hosts. Not very many Swarm Hosts remaining, but... Oh, Gwynblade actually going for Cloak Banshees. Does he, does he have Cloak? No, he doesn't. But he realizes that, hey, there is almost nothing that shoots air, except for Infested Terrans, of course, but that is using up energy. Well, this is this is a really weird game. Both players going for a, for a wonky composition of sorts. Um... I mean, the Seeker Missiles should be used versus uh, Infestors first. Because uh, they don't have that many hit points. If you, can, if you can target down two Seeker Missiles on a group of Infestors, you practically you practically kill a, a very important part of the Zerg army as it is right now. And, uh, well... I don't know, Faulting is switching into Roaches while he's getting Chitinous Plating and trying to get Ultras out. And uh, I don't know how many Marauders Gwynblade does have. He's got way more Marines than Marauders. 
<clears throat> at this point in time. So now those infestors will be key in those fights. If they can lock down the groups of infantry, not only not only the lynx can get us around from the back or from the sides, but also the ultralisks will be able to uh, start hacking away at that infantry. And combined with the locusts, well, it's going to be difficult for Gwynblade to engage. The best option for him at this point is not engage this army, actually, and try to go around, which is exactly what he's doing. Uh, this base will fall, no way to save that one, and Quimblade, well, he's running out of options. Thanks to heavy muling, he will be only on one mining base very shortly here. Oh, the Ultra Cavern is being taken out by Quimblade. So, right now, he's trying to go and sweep through all of the bases. He's, he's going to kill this, he's going to optionally kill this, and then he has to find a way of getting out of here. <laughs> or he can go to the side. Oh my god, Zerg making a crucial mistake here. Instead of going from this side and trying to trying to defend, he's going from the exactly opposite side and Gwynblade can move to the left. And while, while he's cutting away the Zerg army, he can even try to kill his third base as well. The Fungals are preventing any kind of movement so far, but look at the effectiveness of those Marines. They have almost killed everything here, even without moving. That's how strong those upgrades are. And we see that Gwynblade is trolling a little bit, transitioning into battle cruisers. No, I'm just kidding. He's not trolling. He's actually, he's actually transitioning into battle cruisers because there, there is no anti-air and no spire. Folting, on the other hand, is being really aggressive with his expansion uh, policy. He's saying all your base are belong to us, and I want a hatchery in your uh, area of influence. It's almost like the United States of America. So, the game is going to calm down for a little bit here, and you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think Folting has any idea about that battle cruiser transition. No, he doesn't. Once that hits the field, once that hits the field, I think it's going to be game over. And Gwynblade, he's not, he's not even engaging with the battle cruisers yet. They're going to be popping out shortly here, and once they pop, I think, I think it's going to be. I think it's gonna be over because we don't even have a spire for the Zerg player. He does have a hydrogen down, but Hydras, you know, th they're not gonna do anything versus the battle cruisers. Not with the Marines and the uh, Hellbats protecting them. So, Bolting's only chance is to get good fungals on those battle cruisers and good uh, infested Terrans. Even Seeker missiles going off. The Fungals are fungling the battle cruisers, but that is not enough. There is no more remaining energy on those infestors. And well, GG, I couldn't control you at all. What? Is he talking about neural parasite? Because he has hasn't even researched that. Well, but as I said. As soon as those battle cruisers entered the battle, it's just gonna, just it just was game over at that point because no counter. Duh. He could have tried to slow it down a little bit. Could have tried to get a spire down, but you know, spire builds 100 seconds. That's really a lot. So. So thanks everybody for uh, tuning in and for watching. We're going to be moving into the last game here shortly. Just wanted to say that um, we do have a tournament um, upcoming or coming up very shortly. We'll be making an announcement either on Sunday or Monday and opening up the signups. So if you want to play, all you have to do uh, is to be a uh, follower of the stream or following my Twitter and then check my social media for the link. Uh, that will be pointing to the to the uh, sign up thread on Team Liquid. Um, apart from that, if you if you know anyone who would like to have his replay cast, please do tell him about the stream, give him the links and the instructions that if they do have a 10 to 30 minute replay, they would love me to uh, cast and their master versus master games.
all, it, all, all they have to do is send it to Belmar at system.cz and um, title cast my game include a short description that's all there is to it Estman asking when will I post the link Sunday or Monday I just told you <laughs> Eleran, god damn it, I'm not casting lol. You're trying to piss me off. Oh hey Dex, how are you doing? Of course if you want to if you want to uh help the stream, any retweet, any post uh, that you do is almost like giving money. Which you can also do on uh, via your uh PayPal Belmar at Cessnam.cz. It's going to be only used for prize pools in tournament. Nothing else. Alright, cast my game. Number 20. Uh, last replay of today is going to be a TVZ on Whirlwind. So let's hope it's a good one. And, like, even my hands are, like, gluey with sweat so bad so bad so bad stupid weather alright the last game of today and we do have a green Terran spawning on whirlwind in the bottom right position it is going to go ahead and be mad sore it's the nth game I'm casting of him that he submitted his opponent is going to be a guy we cast uh, yesterday for the first time. And uh, it is going to go ahead and be Zaz from We Wanna Win Clan. So both guys, these guys are actually teammates. So I have to assume this is some sort of practice game between those two. And uh, since this is close positions, you know, it opens up, uh, it opens up uh, very interesting um, strategies here on Whirlwind. For example, what uh, a lot of the players like to do is since it's close by air or closer by air, should I say, you build a Stargate right here and you can go for Oracle opening because it's so close to get to your opponent's base. And, uh, well, on the flip side, it is going to be a little bit uh, more difficult or it's going to be more important uh, than in other spawn positions to defend versus drops that the turn is going to be um, applying towards you. Um, additionally, as a Protoss, you don't want to be taking this base in these positions. You want to be taking this as your third base just to prevent those medevacs hopping from here to here all the damn time. You don't want that to happen. So let's see what those two players will be will be doing. Matt, he's getting a, he's getting a fairly quick gas or. Well, maybe not a quick gas, a reasonably timed gas after his initial barracks. Going to be getting uh, uh, Marines. Now, if he doesn't go for a Reaper off of this, that's when things will uh, start to become a little bit interesting. But I, I really doubt he won't go for a Reaper because Reaper, going for Reapers just because of the possibility of uh, the Protoss opening with a Stargate or DTs is very, very beneficial for the Terran player because what the Reaper does is it gives you a lot of scouting. But Matt not going to be doing that, so he's going to be moving into Factory straight away. Is he going to go Hellbat drops? That's about... I mean, he can go Hellions if he if if he wanted to, but he's not even. Oh, he is scouting, so he could go Hellions if he wanted to. That's also a viable option. But Hellbat drops are very, very, very effective versus the enemy mineral lines. And uh, Zas, he's playing as greedy as you can get. Look at this: getting Mothership Core first, then getting the Warp Gate tag, and then he's gonna be getting a Stalker. I hope. That that's a very late stalker. Of course, he did see that there is that this is not a reaper opening. He did see that marine coming out, so he felt safe enough to do so. And uh, well, a th command center being dropped down by Matt, so probably probably not gonna go for uh, for Hellbat. Otherwise, the second gas might have been already down. The armory would have been in production, etc., etc., etc. So it's gonna be Hellions. And uh, 
I don't think he's even... Is he going to get a starport? That's the important thing. Oh, very smart. Getting mines. That will keep him safe. Uh, so far, a Mothership core can actually kill two Marines, no problem. Three Marines might have been a problem. Mothership core might have had to retreat. But two Marines are not a problem at all. And uh, until those Widow Mines are out, the Mothership core can do some more damage. But first two Hellions are out on the map. It will only be these two, because, frankly, Matt can't make any more. Oh, misses the force field, lets the Hellions pass. And uh, let's see how many how many uh, probes the Hellions will get. Meanwhile, the Mothership Corps is scouting out everything, sees the two additional added Raxes. This is not a good position for Zaz to be in. He's losing so much. Ten probes already killed, twelve probes killed, and maybe one more before the Hellion is taken out. He's being chased by a Stalker and a Sentry. I, I mean, those are those are not gonna catch that Hellion anytime soon, and it even gets out safely. So Matt got a full scout. He killed a tremendous amount of uh, of probes, and Zas. Well, he was he's playing really greedy. Uh, before even getting a uh, Robo, he's getting double forge. He's getting additional gases. He's really skimping on units, only having two out at the time, and he's going with double upgrades as fast as possible. Starport being added on by Matt, so he's uh, going to transition into drop play shortly here. Probably going to move that starport over here onto that reactor. Let's see. No, it's going to be a barracks. Well, okay, so this factory probably is going to be building a reactor. Because that starport would not make a lot of sense without the reactor. Probably will be building one by itself. Anyways, back to what Zas is doing. He's already he's getting a okay, so he's getting a robo facility. Now this might be for immortals, it might be for a Colossus transition transition, but I rather I rather doubt it. I mean his gas count is really high. And it's going to be a while um, until he can get those Colossi out, because frankly if you want to continue these upgrades, you gotta get a Twilight Council right now. And that's gonna eat up some of that gas. So both players for the, for the time being just hanging back. Matt's uh, not gonna be moving out on the map. He is going to be using those medibacks maybe in a while here to try to drop his opponent. Uh, until that point in time, he's just using the Hellions. Baiting a full-down overcharge out of that Mothership Core, that's a, that's a very good thing to do. Even if you don't get the kills onto those probes, you know, a, a full-down overcharge lasts 60 seconds, if I'm not mistaken. So, let me actually check that. I think it's 60 seconds. Yeah, 60 seconds. So, Matt knows that has gone down, so he counts to 60 and then goes in, goes in again. And if a second overcharge is activated, he knows that the Mothership Core does not have energy for a third if he comes for a drop. The Twilight Council is a little bit later for Zaz, so he kind of missed his timing there. Uh, but uh, finally he does have at least two additional gateways down. And he's getting two more, so he should have... Well, this is, you know, this is just for defense. He can't be aggressive with these, but given the opening of the turn player and given his overall, overall strategy and um, infrastructure, Zaz should be able to defend this no problem, but he has to know from which angle he's being attacked. Those Hellions are taking uh, notes on uh, what units are coming out of this base and what units are up on the ramp, so Matt doesn't, ha doesn't need to scan. He just needs to check if the army is still positioned here with the Hellions, then go back, and that will tell him that no army is in the main base, and he is going to abuse the shit out of that right now. The Mothership Core a little bit too far away to activate Fulton Overcharge there, so activating it on the natural base to try to uh, take care of those Hellions. But this is three medevac full of units, force fields not as effective, but a full warping of soldiers comes in, and Matt would be wise to load up this drop and get away. Come on, do it. Uh, salvaging something from, from that drop. And, uh, well, that, that wasn't the best of trades for the Terran player. The resources lost count shows that both of these players are roughly equal, but uh, that drop, you know, it, it literally did almost nothing. That's that's the problem. And Zaz is getting 2-2 already. 
Matt is just now getting 1-1, one, one. so Zaz is shooting ahead with the upgrades tremendously, and Matt desperately needs to find a way to put some serious hurt on to Zaz. And he found one. He successfully smuggled in a drop into the main base, and he's, he's go this is so smart, he's going after the probes mainly. Now he needs to cut away from those zealots, but he was going after the probes mainly. This drop is going to die because uh, the soldiers are focusing down the medevacs, but he definitely, definitely did a very good decision there, or made a very good decision there by going for those uh, probes instead of anything else. Getting a third base in the process, so this is another way he's going to try to get ahead. He's going to try to, or is already trying to slow down the Protoss player, prevent him from taking a third base, while he takes a third base of his own. He knows he's behind an upgrade, so he has to get ahead in production. Because once the Protoss gets that storm up, things are gonna start, things, things are gonna become increasingly difficult for Matt to handle. And looks like Zaz is adding two additional gates. That will bring him up to seven. The charge is finished. Uh, the storm is getting very near to being down. A war prism in production. It looks like Zaz is gearing up for an attack. And does Matt have enough? Does he have what it takes to defend this? His plus two, plus two is in the way. Not going to be done by the time Zaz attacks, I don't think. Actually, he should be moving out very shortly here. He's completely safe versus drops with these uh, stalkers there. The warpism is moving out. So let's see if he if he decides to attack or not. He does have storm and he and he does have quite a lot of templars here. He can even morph some of those into archons and that's very effective especially with storm. That's very effective uh, versus a marine based army that Matt is uh, having right now on the field. And uh, you know and Zas as a bonus, he does have an upgrade advantage, so he could go for this. Matt is only 1-1. One, one. Both players kind of posturing around. Nice observer placement by Zas, though. He knows exactly where the army is. Uh, but he pulled those stalkers back from the main base. And he's going for it. He's going for it. And Matt knows. He knows he can't engage this. So this is uh, kind of moving back. Zaz doesn't want to pursue too far out, it seems to me. He's uh, kind of afraid of being dropped from this side. And Matt, well, he sees the army, so that, that's good for him. He sees the army movement, he's trying to circle around, trying to go for the Templars. That's a very smart move here by Matt. But look at the nice force fields coming from Zaz, saving all of those high temps. Right now, Matt's other option is trying to go and counterattack inside the main base, but this might have been a bad decision because he's got almost nothing back home. That's the other part of his army. A mine goes off, immediately being uh, targeted down and killed. Matt evacuating his natural base, tries to save as many of this as he can as he's countering and trying to kill the natural base of the Protoss. If he can hold the ramp and prevent the Protoss from moving up, he, he can be fine with sacrificing this, he's got another base over here and he's killing the natural of his opponent, but he let those units get up, he just doesn't have quite enough of units here to defend multiple storms going off, now Zaz has to be very very careful here not to overextend, he, he just lost his natural and he's in the danger of losing his main base, the mothership core is with the main army though, so he can recall after he does enough damage here, now how much damage is enough, that's only for Zaz to tell. Oh, nice storm there, and a recall following suit. So he can defend his main base, and he will. He's got quite a lot uh, of minerals banked up as well, so he can warp in as many zealots as he can, and then he can double expand at will. Matt still does have a third base here, multiple bunkers being built, he's really afraid of uh, Zaz counterattacking, he doesn't know how much money he's got in the bank and there is uh, plenty of gateways to warp in additional reinforcements, multiple scans going down as well, Matt really needs to know if this natural is being rebuilt and he does know that it is, so that's going to give him a little bit of comfort as he should try to repair some of his buildings, retake the natural base and uh, unsupply block himself. That would be a good thing to do. Bunker economy could go... Uh, could go into play here as well. Salvaging all those bunkers would give him a would give him a short-term financial boost. 
getting 3-3 three, three on his infantry, so realizing that this is a really weird game of low numbers and low army count. And in those kinds of situations, getting an upgrade advantage over your opponent is what is going to give you, or potentially might give you the win. Twilight Council still alive, but Zaz kind of forgetting about those upgrades himself. And he's moving out right now. Matt, I bet you he's got a clock in his in his head. And when he saw that Nex is going up, he's like, I gotta count to 100, and then I'll kill it. Dark Shrine going up as well. Immaculate scans by by Matt, I have to say. He always scans approximately where the army will be. Just goes to show how much or how well he knows his opponent. But Matt Sor, again, dividing his army, might end up being in a very tough position here. The difference is that... Uh, oh, actually, the Mothership Corps is with the army, so... Oh, DT's being worked in defensively. Matt not scanning, not realizing being occupied with defending his main base and uh, that drop is taken out that was half the army of Matt and another warping of Zealots here at the third base so denying further mining and the income for the Terran player is going to start dropping rapidly here to uh, 200 odd minerals as long as these Zealots are alive they are being cleaned up so Matt really using uh, uh, these medevacs nicely for defense this is another another nice thing that he's abusing the shortness of the distance between the third and uh, and his main base, and Zas, well, he needs to buy a little bit of time for himself right now. He's uh, down on probes. He just now finished his natural expansion. He needs to secure that at all costs. So he he'll be harassing with the uh, zealots and uh, containing uh, containing uh, the turn base, a uh, turn player in his own base. Metzor will have none of that, and he might try to decide to go for another drop directly into the main of Zaz. Zaz, well, he just tries to do as much damage as he can. If he takes out this missile turret, it's going to be increasingly difficult for Metzor to deal with those DTs. But the Mothership Core, a very important component of this attack, just gone down. So, after Matt defends this, and he probably will, he needs one more scan and take out those DTs. Come on, Matt, do it. If he can defend this, he might try to go and f go for a counterattack yet again. There is no recall available, but Archons are pretty strong, and uh, Zaz is positioning his units very well. Zod's in the front, Archons in the back, so it's very, very tough for the turn player to uh, target down those Archons. And Zaz is stabilizing. He's getting the upper hand again. Upper hand again. 35 probes versus uh, what? Versus 22 SCVs. Yes, the Terran does have mules, but no, he doesn't have a main. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, Zaz still happily mining off of one base, basically. Um, and, uh, well, he's not taking a third, so he, ha he has to end uh, the game with this attack. Warping and using the DTs, I really like that choice, because essentially what he's doing is uh, he's forcing Matt to burn energy on scans instead of on mules, and Matt would need mules as a bread needs salt right now. But he can't afford to mule. And every time he scans, Zaz just comfortably pulls back. Crazy game, over 50 workers killed on either side. But Zaz still in the lead, still 33 probes versus 20 odd SCVs by the turn player and he still does have that storm Matt doesn't have uh, ghosts on the oh he does he actually does but very few of them four ghosts versus four high temps well that's a that's a good count but he's got but he has to get those EMPs slash snipes off and even more Templars being warped in by uh, by Zaz so you know even when he doesn't have Storm available, he can still go Archon. The one advantage right now for Matt is the upgrades. If he can prevent, or, or if he can avoid donating units to his opponent, and massing a little bit larger army for himself, he might be able to break through this. But it's going to be difficult when he's uh, engaging uh, at a point in time where he's got less amount of units out on the field than his opponent. He's doing a nice job... Uh, uh, Micro in here, I have to say. He's kiting very efficiently, but he always has to stay out of the range of those Archons. Uh, those Medivacs staying on top of those Archons is not good news, though, because 
know, th those are very, very important right now for the for the Terran player. Matsor, though, finally back on two bases. He needs to replenish his SCV count currently. And Zaz, well, <sighs> this is I don't I don't know how this will end. Zaz is Zaz is being really smart about this. Uh, he never engages without storm. He tries to force as many scans as possible using those DTs and, and saving uh, their lives. Look at this DT. Three kills on this one, seven kills on this one. And, uh, well, Matt... Matt, he's trying to harass at, le at least with Widow Mines, if nothing else. Zaz does have a pawn here, so he doesn't have to walk his units all the way across uh, from the main base. Oh. Is this going to be enough? I rather doubt it. 23 SCVs compared to 26 pros. That's still one base economy, but Zaz does have does have the army advantage, I would say. If Matt would build a couple more ghosts and get a crucial EMP off right now, which he doesn't, and he loses more SCVs. 71 SCVs killed total, and as Matt loses this natural expansions, he's down and out for the count. Zero income for both of these players very soon here as another drop occurring uh, in the natural of the Protoss, which is his only mining base right now. But Matt, he's being pushed back into his main base where he has zero mining, he's got zero income. Zas will be able to start mining momentarily here as he gets rid of those mines. He has to rebuild the robo and get an observer very quickly before this robo is killed. With that observer, he'll be able to forge... He'll be able to kill off that mine, resume mining, and as long as he keeps uh, the Terran pinned back into his base, he's gonna have the ultimate advantage. He's uh, gonna be mining and the Terran will not. And without medevacs, oh my god, one more storm could actually kill that army. Matt has to be so careful right now, moving down that ramp. Zaz has him against the ropes right now. After a very crazy game, the smarter player wins. Oh my goodness! Despite splitting his army almost perfectly, still more storms are going down. And this is it for the Terran player. Matt will have to tap out of this game. More Archons being morphed and Matt Sor, he doesn't have anything to replenish this army with. One Marine is not gonna cut it. Zaz got rid of the Widow Mine almost here. Almost. But he does have the army. Matt doesn't. This is a... Matt's are even saying, you have a ninja expansion somewhere or what? Zaz going, this is my last one. I don't, I don't even have any money. There's the GG from Matt Zor. <laughs> what a fucking good game, I have to say. Really good game. That's uh, that was decided not by not by a macro uh, style, not by you know complicated stratagems, but with it was decided with smart thinking. I like those types of games. I really like those types of games, you know, because that's like if that's like saying you're not allowed to make unit X, Y, Z in this game, and that has you thinking, okay, how do I win when I can't build Colossi? So essentially, what this game was about, both players were really, really, really constricted in uh, what they could actually do, so they had to think really hard about what's the absolute best way that I can use my resources and what's the absolute best best way to engage where when and how and for lo and for how long and I just think that the smarter player won A really nice game Alright guys, I'm gonna be turning the stream off, I'm gonna ha be having a little bit of a break. Thank you very much for watching, every 13 people out there. If you like the production, uh, you can help me out by uh, following me on Twitter and retweeting my posts. 
uh, when I when I go live. You can tell your friends about the stream to come watch uh, next time. What I would appreciate more are more replays, actually, because I'm really running out of good games to cast. So if you want your game casted, mail it to me to belnoir.cesnam.cz, title cast my game, include a short description of what rough, roughly transpired in the game. Remember, it's 1v1s between 10 to 30 minutes, approximately, at least master level players. If you have friends that are masters, and would like to get their games casted, tell them about this. I would love to see their, uh, see their games and I would love to cast them. Um, so, yeah, that's gonna be it for today. Thank you for watching. Archive viewers watching the VODs on uh, YouTube, hello to you as well, heart. And, um, yeah. Just remember to uh, storm first and uh, ask questions later. Uh, for those guys live on stream, I'll see you in a bit. I'm gonna play some later because it's the 20th episode of Cast My Game and I feel like celebrating. Huzzah!